So this is video lecture part B of chapter three on cells, the living unit. And we're going to look at section 3.4 first here, uh, titled active membrane transport. And your learning outcomes here are uh, to differentiate between primary and secondary active transport, and then compare and contrast endocytosis and exocytosis in terms of function and direction and then compare and contrast penocytosis, phagocytosis, and receptor-mediated uh, endocytosis. So uh, to start, there are gonna be two major active transport processes. One is active transport and the other is vesicular transport. And the key thing here is that both are gonna require energy from ATP to move solutes across the plasma membrane. And uh, this will be for the following reasons. Either the solute that we're moving is too large for channels. The solute is not lipid soluble, so it can't go right through the plasma membrane. Or the solute is not able to move down its concentration gradient. And here, perhaps more accurate would be not that it's not able to, but it's not uh, sort of the normal process or the intention of the cell. The cell's intention is to actually move the solute uh, in a way that would require energy, which means against its concentration gradient from low to high uh, concentration. So here, um, uh, this is gonna require, uh, when it comes to active transport itself. Uh, so we'll look at vesicular transport in a little bit. So active transport here is gonna require carrier proteins that we refer to sometimes as pumps uh, to suggest an active uh, situation requiring energy. Uh, and here these proteins have, or will bind specifically and reversibly to the substances being moved. So they'll bind, they'll have a great uh, affinity for the molecule they bind to, and once they move them across, the affinity changes and they lose uh, that, or uh, have a reduced affinity and release the solute on the other side. Now, some car uh, carriers transport more than one substance across. If it only, if we do have a pump that transports only one substance, then we'll call that a uni uh, porter. Otherwise, we have uh, transporters that will transport more than one substance. And if the substances being transported across actively are going in opposite directions, then we'll call those antiporters. If we are transporting more than one uh, solute across in the same direction, then we'll call that a symporter, okay? Uh, but here, um, the key thing is we're gonna be moving solutes against their concentration gradient. Uh, and that's going to require energy. When we say against or up, that means you're going from low to high, which is the opposite of diffusion or something that would be more passive. So this is, again, going to require that energy from ATP. We're going to look at two types of active transport. One is primary active transport and the other is secondary. In primary active transport, uh, the energy is going to come directly from ATP hydrolysis. So basically, we take the energy directly from ATP and move the solute against its concentration gradient from low to high. In secondary active transport, we're going to use that energy indirectly because uh, we used the ATP earlier to pump a solute uh, up its concentration gradient. Once you build that concentration on one side, where you have a real high concentration, now you build potential uh, energy because that solute wants to come back across where there's less concentration. So we can harness that energy of the buildup of, of uh, an ion or a, or, a, or a particle on one side, then we can use that energy of it coming back across to do, to do the work for us. So looking at primary active transport uh, here, we're going to hydrolyze, hydrolysis, uh, hydrolyze ATP. And when we do that, that's going to cause a shape change in our transport protein. Uh, so the energy provided to there would be used to change the shape of the protein uh, to move the solute across uh, up its concentration gradient. Uh, so um, examples of these types of pumps include calcium pumps, proton pumps, which is a hydrogen ion, and uh, sodium and potassium pump. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus in on the most well-studied pump, which is the sodium potassium pump. We're going to see this come up in our study of physiology. And basically the pump is an enzyme called ATPase uh, that's going to pump sodium out of the cell and potassium back into the cell. 
Every cycle, we're going to end up pumping uh, three sodiums out and two potassiums in. This will be located, this pump is located on all plasma membranes, but it is especially active in excitable cells. Excitable cells are those that respond to a stimulus um, with a change in, in uh, the concentration of these charged particles. And these include uh, nerve cells or neurons and muscle cells. So let's take a look at this uh, sodium potassium pump and be sure and check out the animation that I have available to you on the weekly activities document. But you can see here we're going to start with our, there's our plasma membrane and the beige or orange colored area is the inside of the cell and the outside green, uh, uh, greenish area is the extracellular fluid outside of the cell. You, there's your dipper bilayer and here is your pump, your sodium potassium pump. And you can see we're going to start our cycle with an ATP molecule binded already to the pump and in this position here, uh, in this particular shape of uh, of the pump here, the uh, pump is going to have a greater affinity for sodium ions modeled by these yellow spheres. So they're going to come in and attach three of them at once. And once all three sodium ions attach, that causes uh, the uh, sodium potassium pump to hydrolyze the ATP. So the ATP uh, hydrolyzes, breaking off one of the phosphates. Now it becomes ADP and the uh, adenosine diphosphate is reduced. And we've now phosphorylated uh, the enzyme here or the pump. And so there's that uh, purple sphere here is the, with the phosphate attached. That, so that process here is going to cause this pump to change shape. And as it changes shape it and uh, opens up to the outside, of the plasma membrane, it loses its affinity for those sodium ions. So the sodium ions uh, fall off there. And this also now changes the affinity of the pump. And now the affinity for this pump now is that to be more attracted to the few potassium ions that are outside. So now potassium ions are gonna come in and bind. Okay, and as they bind uh, inside into that pump there, that's going to cause the release or dephosphorylation of the pump. So you can see here in step five here that once the potassiums are bound, the phosphate falls off, the pump changes shape, and now we lose the affinity for potassium. So in this particular configuration of this protein here, it now no longer really likes potassium, so potassium falls off onto the inside. Uh, and again, it's two potassium ions. Uh, and so now we're back in our uh, ready to start our new position here. Another ATP, fresh ATP molecule comes in and binds. And overall, this is going to change the affinity uh, for the pump. And it's not going to have a greater affinity for any of those uh, sodium ions that are in there. And then we go back to step one again. Uh, the uh, sodium ions are going to begin to bind in there. Uh, and we repeat the cycle again. So every one ATP uh, is enough to uh, power this uh, cycle here, which pumps three, three sodiums out and two potassiums inside. So uh, the sodium potassium uh, is going to basically change the concentrations. And what we're going to do is we're going to build up more concentration of sodium ions outside the membrane in the extracellular fluid that we see here. And we're going to end up getting more potassiums along the inside of the, of the cell. Uh, and so we're going to have a buildup of potassium ions there. Now, there are going to be leak channels, which I've drawn in this diagram here. Uh, so uh, the leak channels, there's, they're uh, specific. We have both sodium leak channels and potassium leak channels. And I purposely draw through two potassium leak channels to show that we have more of those than we do sodium. So this explains the, the physical nature of this membrane in that the membrane will be more leaky the potassium. So we'll have more potassium leaking down its concentration gradient passively uh, from an area where it's higher. So our potassiums will be leaking out of the cell. I'm going to draw arrows going through those. And our sodium would be leaking down its concentration gradient moving into the cell. But overall, you're going to have more, more potassium, the K pluses, leaking out than sodium leaking in. Uh, now, we know that the potassium, the sodium potassium pump, which I've drawn uh, right here, is going to be uh, continuously working to pump those three sodiums out and two potassiums in, but these channels are going to continue to allow these ions to move. Uh, we know that the sodium potassium pump is pumping more than one ion, so that, and in opposite directions, so that makes it an anti-porter. 
and that's going to help maintain those concentration gradients where sodium is always more outside and potassium is always more on the inside. What this is going to do is it's going to maintain these electrochemical gradients. Electrical because we do have charged particles and chemical because we have specific types of particles, right? And so these gradients are going to be essential uh, for the functions, especially of muscle and nervous tissue, which rely on the plasma membranes of their cells to maintain these gradients. Uh, and then that provides a potential energy uh, to do some work that those cells do. So uh, now we're going to look at secondary active transport here. And in secondary active transport, remember, we're not going to be using the energy directly uh, from uh, ATP. Instead, we're going to pump a specific ion on one side of the membrane and then build up its gradient and then use that gradient to do work to move something else that would require energy. Uh, so we're using the energy indirectly here. So this is going to depend on an ion gradient uh, that was created previously by primary active transport. And here, this is going to build up energy, stored energy, which is potential energy in those gradients. And so that uh, potential energy that we're going to have here uh, the stored is going to indirectly transport other solutes across. And so an example here is there is a gradient due to the sodium potassium pump we just saw earlier. Remember, that's a uh, model right here on the left of the diagram. There's your sodium potassium pump. Remember, we get three sodiums pumped out and uh, uh, pumped out of there and two potassiums pumped in uh, to, the, to the membrane. But overall, that's going to build up a great concentration of sodiums with relatively little sodiums on the inside. So we're gonna have low sodium concentration on the inside uh, of there. So the, the greater concentration of sodium on the outside is gonna to wanna to move in, right? So uh, if we can provide other proteins, transport proteins that we see here drawn on the right, that are specific for those sodium ions, and when they bind to those sodium ions, will allow the sodium to move, but those pumps also bind to another molecule which is in lower concentration outside. Uh, for example, these glucose molecules in this diagram. So uh, what happens here is if the sodium and the, the glucose bind at the same time, then it causes a shape change. The sodium moves in because of its potential energy and that potential energy uh, in action now moving in causes or allows us to help us move the glucose up its concentration gradient, which would normally require energy, but we don't have to use ATP because of the potential energy out here due to the buildup of sodium ions. So this makes that secondary because we're not using any ATP directly here. I do have animation also available on the weekly uh, documents that shows this pump, uh, uh, this uh, secondary active transport, uh, and it also shows the sodium potassium pump how they work together. So be sure and check that uh, link out and go check out that animation. Overall, if we had to categorize this kind of secondary active transport which is moving both the sodium and sugar uh, together in the same direction, that would be referred to as a symporter, to use a terminology from earlier. Now we're going to look at vesicular transport. Uh, and here, this is going to be uh, involve the transport of large particles or groups of particles uh, or fluids across the membrane in these membraneous sacs that we're going to call vesicles. So vesicle is, uh, they look like little bubbles in our drawings of cells in there and they're surrounded by a uh, bilayer. So it's a membrane, just like any other membrane in the cell. But moving this, uh, this bulk materials uh, through membranes is gonna require energy in the form of ATP. So vesicular transport, this kind of transport involves uh, endocytosis uh, and that's transport into the cell. Uh, and then exocytosis for out, which is gonna be out of the cell. Uh, and when it comes to endocytosis, there's going to be three types we're going to look at. One is phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and then a receptor-mediated endocytosis, which would involve special receptors for very specific particles. There's also a process called transcytosis, which involves both taking in and exiting of materials in bulk. Uh, so we're transporting across the membrane. So this would involve both endo and exocytosis. And then this within the cell, we're going to have vesicular trafficking where vesicles will be moving around from one area or organelle uh, in the cell to another. So from, say, maybe the um, um, rough endoplasmic, we're taking them to the Golgi. And so that would be trafficking going on within there. So let's take a look closely at endocytosis. And there's a diagram on the right. I'll, I'll explain a little bit. 
but when it comes to endocytosis, this is going to involve the formation of vesicles when we take in. Uh, those, those vesicles may be protein coated and it usually may involve receptors. Uh, so if it does involve receptors, then we're talking about bringing in very, very specific molecules. So those receptors bind on the plasma membrane and cause the uh, the formation of the of the ves of the of the vesicle uh, during the endocytosis. The substances being pulled in um, have to be able to bind to those receptors if it's really going to be that specific. Now there is uh, unfortunate consequences that some pathogens, disease-causing agents, uh, have evolved uh, to hijack those receptors. In other words, they use those receptors get in the cell. And this includes both bacteria and viral particles uh, that have the right uh, surface structures on the outside to bind to some of those receptors. Now, once that vesicle is pulled inside, it may uh, go infused with a lysosome. Uh, and a lysosome is a, is a vesicle that digests materials in there, or it may be transported across as trans, uh, transcytosis. Let's take a look at the diagram on the right here, looking at step one. Uh, your substances are going to be ingested into the cells, so this is an endocytosis there. And the vesicle form may have a protein coating on there, not always, but it, it may. Uh, the protein coated vesicle then, once it's taken in by endocytosis, detaches and your vesicle is taken in. Okay, uh, and then the coated protein uh, that were at the surface are going to be released and are recycled back to the plasma membrane for a repeat of this process. The uncoated endocytic vesicle then, which we now have here, the membrane is no longer contains those proteins, is gonna fuse with an endosome. So here we have a, a endo means within, soma means body, so this is a vesicle within the cell, and it will fuse with that endosome, okay? Now, some of the uh, membrane proteins will, uh, will be moved with a transport vesicle, uh, and then move some of the membrane materials back to be recycled in the plasma membrane. Okay, so this endosome is basically going to be sorting uh, some of the material that was taken in. And so there's two possibilities here uh, after that process has occurred here. So what's left behind is going to be a vesicle that can fuse, in this case with a lysosome. So we see that occurring here. And when the two membranes fuse, what is, uh, what's left of that uh, uh, vesicle taken in and the uh, lysosome, their membranes fuse, we can see that right here. The lysosome contain digestive enzymes that spills into the materials taken in, and we can break down those particles into smaller bits uh, for cellular digestion. The other possibility is that the vesicle then just go ahead and moves to the other side of the cell, fuses with that membrane, and the materials are then released to the other side. We know that process is called transcytosis. So we see that, uh, that term again there. For phagocytosis, uh, here's a cytosis of the cell process. And phagos, you're going to see that in several words on this slide here. Uh, phago means to eat. Okay, so phagocytosis literally translated means cell eating. And here, uh, you may have on the, mem on the membrane may form these projections. So the cell moves its cytoplasm around and forms these projections that I'm pointing to right here that will then wrap around the food particle. And those, protect, uh, those projections are called, um, they're called pseudopods or pseudopodia, which means false feet. And, and the reason they're given that is because those that are capable of doing this actually move or can move around and crawl around uh, surfaces as they move their cytoplasm around. So it's like literally little feet uh, or figuratively, I guess, little feet uh, helping the cell move around. So there's a, literally translated would mean false feet, right? So uh, that will help produce a, during that type of endocytosis, uh, uh, when you're cell eating, that would form a phagosome, which means eaten body. Remember, phagos means to eat. So once we do the endocytosis, the uh, vesicle is taken in, and that vesicle now is called a phagosome. Uh, and so um, this phagocytosis is going to be used by cells, uh, special cells in your in your body called macrophages, which literally means large macro eaters, and certain other white cells. Um, so this uh, these phagocytic cells will move by amoeboid motion, uh, and that's where these pseudopods are 
are made as the cytoplasm flows and these cells crawl along surfaces. And this is taken after uh, an organism called an amoeba, which uh, is a single-celled organism that lives in water that also moves uh, by that way. Now, I should point out that during phagocytosis, sometimes the cell has very specific receptors for certain uh, uh, particles to take in and sometimes uh, does not. But usually the cell recognizes the particle before it takes it in with those special receptors. Pinocytosis instead is, instead of eating, pino means to drink. So this is cell drinking. So pinocytosis would be taking in fluids and any of the solutes uh, that are dissolved within that fluid. Here the plasma membrane is gonna enfold and it's gonna bring in the fluid and any of the dissolved solutes. And this would be forming uh, a, a vesicle that's been taken in and then it can go and fuse with the endosome as we saw earlier in the first diagram. Uh, where the endosome was mentioned. Uh, this will be used by some cells to sample the environment, see what's uh, on going on out there. Uh, and this is the main way that nutrient absorption occurs in your small intestine. So when the particles along the wall of your uh, small intestine, inside your small intestine, have been digested to the basic units like simple sugars and amino acids, they're going to be taken into the, the uh, the initial cells before being transported across uh, the cell into the bloodstream. Um, and again, as usual, when these uh, vesicles are taken in, the membrane components can be recycled back to the plasma membrane. And then we have receptor mediated uh, endocytosis. And here this involves endocytosis and transcytosis of specific molecules here. Uh, many cells are going to have receptors uh, for very specific molecules and they're going to be embedded in clathrin coated pits. So you can see that model here. We have our receptors on the outside for very specific molecules. And then on the inside is uh, special proteins called clathrin. So there's there would be a clathrin coated pit and when the right uh, molecules are there, they bind to those receptors and then that induces the endocytosis of the fluids in this case. Um, uh, so it'd be like cell drinking for very specific particles in there. Uh, now types of molecules that might be transported in include enzymes, uh, low density lipoproteins or LDLs, iron, uh, insulin, which is the hormone taken in the cells. Uh, but again, unfortunately, some uh, pathogens have evolved uh, the ability to bind to these receptors and induce uh, their entry into the cell. And that includes viruses, diphtheria, cholera, uh, toxins can be taken in and cause problems uh, and disease. There are also small pits on other cells called calveoli. These are smaller pits. They're also protein coated, but it's going to be different protein uh, than clathrin. And again, the, the, the protein coated pits may be for some specific molecules. Examples include folic acid and unfortunately, uh, tetanus toxin, which is produced by a bacterial pathogen. We don't want those uh, getting in. We'll see calveoli come up uh, specifically when we cover smooth muscle, but uh, kind of the same concept, very specific receptors for certain particles to get them into the cell. And then we have exocytosis here. And in exocytosis, this is going to be a process uh, where material is ejected from the cell, exo for like exiting. Uh, and this is usually activated by uh, cell surface signals or changes in membrane uh, voltage uh, for this. Now the substances being injected are gonna be enclosed in a special kind of vesicle called secretory vesicle, which means uh, for excretion. Now, how does the this vesicle containing the materials actually know it needs to go to the plasma membrane uh, to release the material outside? Well, there are gonna be special proteins on the surface of the vesicle, the secretory vesicle and the plasma membrane, and they recognize each other. So sort of like a, a, a chemical recognition. And so uh, on the vesicle, those proteins are going to be called V snare. V is for vesicle. And then on the plasma membrane, the proteins that are recognized by V snare are called T snare for target, uh, target snare proteins. When they dock, that's going to trigger exocytosis. Now substances that are exocytosed or uh, released from the cell include hormones like insulin, neurotransmitters, which are released by neurons or nerve cells, mucus, and 
even uh, excretion, uh, excretory, ex excretion products or waste products from cells are released this way. So let's take a look here at a model for that. Uh, in step one here, you can see we have a transport vesicle, a membrane-bound vesicle containing materials to be exocytose. You have your vesicular snare particles, and then the plasma membrane has the T-snare. So when the V-snare and the T-snare find each other, they're going to fuse, as we see in the second picture, and then going to the third picture. Once those proteins fuse, a pore is formed, and then that pore is going to open up and allow uh, the particles to be released and uh, to the outside. And so that's exocytosis. So uh, looking at a question here, when the movement of sodium ions, when movement of sodium ions down their concentration gradient drives the transport of other substances across the cell, uh, this is called, is it A, primary active transport, B, secondary active transport, C, vesicular transport, or D, pumping. Now, Another question to consider uh, as you go through the material is that uh, here is it says cells that store large quantities of chemicals to be released do so in structures called is it A snares, B docking sacs, C fusion sacs, or D vesicles. And so now we have a, a, th a third question here the sodium potassium pump is it A pump sodium and potassium out of the cell, is it B? pump sodium and potassium into the cell, or is it C, pump sodium into and potassium out of the cell, or D, pump sodium out of the cell and potassium into the cell. I'm going to move on to section 3.5, uh, which is membrane potential. In here, the learning objectives are uh, to define membrane potential and explain how the resting membrane potential is established and maintained. So. Uh, what we're going to be talking about here is resting membrane potential, or RMP, and this is uh, electrical potential energy. Uh, and this will be produced by the separation of oppositely charged particles. And we separate positive and negative particles from each other, they're going to want to have, uh, there's a tendency for them to want to move back together, and so that creates a potential energy. And in physics, we call that a voltage. So uh, potential, electrical potential energy generally is referred to as a, a voltage in units of volts. And we're gonna be talking here about many volts uh, level uh, of uh, potential difference across the membrane. Now, when we do have that separation of charge, because we'll have positive on one side of the membrane and negative on the other, we're gonna to refer to that as being polarized. Uh, and the voltage is only going to occur along the surface of the membrane. So that's something important to remember. The rest of the extracellular fluid uh, and the, the cell inside is going to be neutral. So along the membrane, we'll have voltages ranging from between negative 50 to negative 100 millivolts uh, in different cells. Now, the negative sign just means that we're looking at what the charge is on the inside. The outside would be positive. So if RMP for a cell, for example, was minus 70 millivolts, that means the inside is negative, the outside is positive, the outside would be positive 70 millivolts. It would be the same magnitude of potential energy. We're just going to track the inside and any changes that might occur in there um, when any changes happen along the membrane of the cell. So now here's a, the thing to look at here. So. Uh, potassium is going to be that key player, that potassium ion that we saw earlier uh, as far as resting memory potential. So potassium is that key player. And the reason for that is that uh, the sodium potassium pump had built up a lot of potassium on the inside. So you see in the diagram on the right, there's, you see a lot more potassium inside. You see some potassium outside. The opposite is true for sodium. There's more sodium outside than inside, right? So if we have these leak channels, that uh, um, that we saw earlier, uh, the potassium is going to want to leak uh, down this concentration gradient and it would leak uh, out of the cell. So we see that leaking going on out of the cell. Uh, there's going to be some negatively charged particles that cannot leave, and these include large particles, uh, negatively charged proteins, and those are indicated here in the drawing. Yeah, and the A for anion for negatively charged, so they cannot move. So as the potassium begins to move out, the inside along the membrane here is going to become more negative. Right? 
and the outside along the membrane is going to become more positive as that happens. So we're going to start to build up that polarization along the membrane. Now, as the inside becomes more negative, those same sodium ions, I mean potassium ions, the K pluses are going to want to leak back in because they're being drawn in by the, the buildup of negative charge. Now, there's going to be a balance between the, the potassiums wanting to move out down their concentration gradient and the potassiums wanting to move in because of the electrical gradient that occurs there. Uh, so now when the drive for that potassium to leave balances the drive for the potassium wanting to come in because of the electrical gradient that we have there, we're now going to be at our resting membrane potential. So these particles will continue to move, but we'll be in a sort of equilibrium there where any new particles that leave are going to be replaced by those coming in. And that would be at a resting membrane potential of negative 90 millivolts. Uh, so that electrochemical gradient then that we're describing here is basically dictated by the movement of potassium ions. Potassium is the key player again. Now in many cells there's also leak channels and we saw that earlier that the leak channels though are going to be lower in number for sodium. Now sodium is going to be is, is going to want to move uh, down its concentration gradient to begin with but it's also positively charged so that sodium is also attracted to the buildup of that negative charge uh, on the inside of the membrane and the uh, excessive positive charge on the outside and so that sodium is going to be coming in and so when that sodium comes in that's going to bring the charge up to negative 70 millivolts so if we were to look at uh, a number line here and we're at and this is our millivolt here and we're at negative 90 uh, right here when the sodium is allowed to come in now we shift back up here to a negative 70 because we're adding positives inside. More positives are going to go from uh, negative closer to, uh, to zero, right? So at this point here, when the sodium is allowed to move down its concentration gradient, then we're now set at our resting membrane potential, which includes uh, the sodium ions moving in, not just the potassium, uh, the potassium's movement. Uh, so remember that uh, because there's more potassium ion uh, channels, leak channels, then the it's potassium that's the key player, but sodium uh, adjusts it slightly to negative 70. So when we have more uh, leakage for potassium ions, as I said, it's more permeable to potassium. So potassium is the primary influence then. Now there is chloride ions, you can see them drawn in there, but they don't play a role there. And this is because uh, the concentration and electrical gradients are balanced when it comes to uh, chloride. There. So chloride does not influence the RM theoretic membrane potential. So the active transport of the sodium potassium pump is going to help maintain those gradients that we saw there. Uh, so the potassium uh, sodium potassium pump plays a role in this. Uh, so the resting membrane potential uh, then is going to be maintained by the action of the sodium potassium pump, which is going to continuously eject those three sodium ions out of the cell and brings two potassiums back in. So this steady state of RMP or the resting membrane potential is due to the fact of the active pumping of sodium. So uh, as the sodium potassium pump is working, then uh, an equal number of sodiums are going to be pumped out as those uh, being uh, uh, leaking back in uh, overall. And that's going to maintain our resting membrane potential at minus um, 70 millivolts. Again, though, potassium is the key player. I'm going to show a little animation here uh, in a bit, but this uh, this resting memory potential is extremely important for the functioning of neurons, which are cells of the nervous system and muscle cells. What's going to happen here is that the cell is going to become excited, okay? and the cell is normally at a resting memory potential of minus 70. Uh, when the leak channels are working, the sodium potassium uh, pump is working. Now, when the cell becomes excited, um, the membrane is stimulated to open another kind of channel that are gated, and these are sodium and potassium channels. So if the membrane becomes excited and those gates open up, now these ions rush rapidly. Right now they're closed during rest, but if we excite them, the ions come uh, rush in rapidly. Now, because the sodium gates open first, the sodium is going to rush in 
them because there's more sodium outside. And when the sodium rushes in, it's positively charged. So the coming in positive charged sodium ions are gonna bring this membrane potential up and we're gonna depolarize. In fact, we're gonna overshoot and the inside is gonna end up becoming more positive. So when we get to about plus 30, the sodium gates close and the potassium gates open. So now the potassium that's, uh, we have higher concentration of potassium inside is gonna rush out and potassium has positive charge. We're gonna lose positive charge and that brings the membrane potential back down again. Overall, we're gonna call this change right there on, on the membrane. That's gonna be called an action potential, which we're gonna see again uh, later on when we look at how nerve and muscle cells work. So that would be called an action potential. In that case, we go from our resting membrane potential to a depolarization and then repolarization. The depolarization is because sodiums move in and the repolarization is because potassium ions move out. So here's the uh, animation and we'll see how the resting membrane potential works. The human brain alone contains about 100 billion nerve cells called neurons. A neuron, like every other cell, has positively and negatively charged ions inside and outside. Further, a resting neuron has a greater negative charge on the inside surface of the plasma membrane and a greater positive charge on the outside surface. This partitioning of charge creates a voltage difference across the membrane known as the resting membrane potential, which can be measured using a voltmeter. On average, an intracellular electrode records a value of minus 70 millivolts. The resting membrane potential depends on two factors. First, it depends on the presence of sodium and potassium gradients across the plasma membrane. Specifically, there are more sodium ions outside the neuron than inside and more potassium ions inside the neuron than outside. Second, the resting membrane potential depends on the differential permeability of the plasma membrane to sodium and potassium ions. Leak channels in the plasma membrane allow sodium and potassium ions to diffuse or leak down their concentration gradients. The membrane contains many more potassium leak channels than sodium leak channels. Thus, the membrane is much more permeable, or leaky, to potassium ions. As positively charged potassium ions leak out of the neuron, the inside surface of the membrane becomes negatively charged compared to the outside surface. If potassium was the only ion moving, the potential would stabilize at minus 90 millivolts. However, positively charged sodium ions leak into the neuron, which slightly offsets the negative charge and raises the voltmeter reading to minus 70 millivolts. Sodium-potassium pumps actively transport sodium ions out of the neuron and potassium ions back in, compensating for the sodium and potassium leaks. Thus, the pumps help to maintain the resting membrane potential. So why is the plasma membrane more permeable to potassium ions than to sodium ions? Is it A, the action of the sodium potassium pump? Is it B, there is more sodium leak channels? Is it C, there is less potassium leak channels? Is it D, there is more potassium uh, channels? Or E, none of these. Now we're gonna move on to Section 3.6, and uh, this is cell environmental interactions uh, here. So our learning outcomes are gonna be one to describe the role of cell adhesion molecules in allowing cells to interact with their environment. And the second one is to list the roles of membrane receptors and that of E protein coupled receptors. So um, cells do interact with their environment by responding directly uh, to other cells or indirectly through extracellular chemicals. Uh, so 
the interactions are always going to involve that glycocalyx, that sugar coating on the outside. And components to this uh, overall covering include cell adhesion molecules, or CAMs for short, and plasma membrane receptors, which are usually proteins. Now, uh, every cell, when it comes to CAMs and their role, every cell has thousands of sticky glycoprotein CAMs projecting from their membrane. And here are some of their functions. First one is to anchor the cell to the extracellular matrix or to each other. Second one is going to be to assist in the movement of cells past one another. Uh, a third one is to attract white blood cells to injured or infected areas. Uh, and another is to stimulate the synthesis or degradation of adhesive membrane junctions, for example, uh, tight junctions. And then another is to transmit intracellular signals to direct cell migration, uh, division, uh, or multiplying, uh, proliferation, and the specialization of cells uh, to differentiate from one cell, uh, from a basic cell type to a more specific functioning cell type. Uh, so membrane receptor uh, proteins serve as binding sites for uh, several chemicals. Now we're going to look at our receptors instead of uh, the CAMs. And uh, there's uh, two kinds involved here. We have contact signaling and then chemical signaling. So in contact signaling, the cells, uh, when they touch each other, are going to recognize each other by the unique surface receptors. So we recognize very specific uh, proteins on their surface. Now this is going to be a normal part uh, contact signaling of development as state cells migrate past each other during tissue formation and this is also important uh, contact signaling during immunity when we want to build up immunity cells contact each other to give information about uh, potential pathogens that are in the body. Uh, and then we have uh, chemical signaling and here the interaction is going to be between the, the plasma cell receptors and ligands. Ligand is a general term for these chemical messengers that cause the changes in activities of the cell. Uh, in some cells, the binding is going to trigger uh, enzyme activation. So when the ligand binds to the surface, it, it uh, may activate an enzyme on the inside of the cell. In others, it may be a more direct effect by uh, causing a gated channel to open. Earlier I mentioned uh, uh, sodium gates are normally closed, but this binding could cause a sodium gate to open. And that effect would be changing the, the resting membrane potential because now you're now allowing the, the ions to move uh, at a much greater rate than at rest. Uh, examples of ligands include neurotransmitters, which are chemicals released by neurons hormones that are released from endocrine glands, and local chemical messengers called paracrines. These occur at very specific locations where cells are communicating with each other uh, within those tissues. Uh, so uh, some, the same ligand, when it comes to these chemical messengers, the same one can actually cause a different response in different cells, depending on the chemical pathway uh, that the receptor is part of. Uh, for example, uh, uh, sometimes smooth muscle cells are activated by uh, uh, a certain messenger and uh, this can cause them to contract but that same ligand uh, may cause uh, smooth muscle in other parts to relax. So there's uh, two different responses to the same ligand. Uh, ligand here in this case might be epinephrine. Now when the ligand does bind, uh, to the receptor, and this is going to be true of any globular proteins, these are proteins that are non-fibrous, uh, that protein is going to change shape. So that's something to remember, anytime something binds to a globular uh, protein, uh, it changes shape. And that shape change may activate or inactivate. Uh, so here it says it may become activated, but the same is also true of binding could cause inactivation of, of the protein. Now, some uh, of the activated receptors become enzymes, so they, uh, the protein now is basically switched on uh, to cause a uh, enzymatic reaction. And others may act as uh, ligands that when they bind, they open or close gates. Uh, so the gate opens, it'll allow particles to move down their concentration gradient. If it closes, it'll stop that movement. This is important, especially uh, 
when it comes to resting membrane potential to open up sodium and potassium gates, that would change the membrane potential on us. Now we're going to look at chemical uh, signaling and a very, very specific kind uh, called G protein linked uh, receptors uh, right here. So um, these uh, are going to indirectly cause cellular changes uh, when they activate G proteins. Uh, so this is generally called signal transduction where the ligand binds from the outside. It doesn't come in, it binds and then changes the shape and then causes this uh, movement of information into the cell. So we're transducing that cell inward. Uh, so what's going to happen here is the G protein can then go on and affect ion channels or activate other enzymes or even activate secondary messengers, uh, chemicals that are within the cell. Normally inactive, we activate them. An example of a secondary messenger in, within the cell is cyclical AMP. Another one would be calcium uh, ions themselves. Uh, so let's take a look at this uh, protein linked receptor. Overall, think of it as one uh, set of proteins transmitting information to another set of proteins uh, along the relays as they have sort of drawn up here on the top right here. So. In step one here, your ligand, your messenger, binds to the protein. And we know when that binding occurs, it's going to change the shape here. Uh, so the shape change occurs. Here is your G protein right here. That binding to the ligand will activate that receptor, uh, and then it'll bind to that G protein and then activate it. The G protein will then change shape, which turns it on, and it's going to cause it to release a GDP. A GDP is kind of like an ADP. Instead of adenosine diphosphate, it's uh, guanosine diphosphate. So it's another energy type molecule. And so when uh, the binding occurs, it's going to cause the G protein to, uh, and we're activating, cause the, the G protein to release the GDP and then pick up uh, GTP, which like ATP is an energy source, right? And so uh, now that activated G protein with this GTP can go on and activate or inactivate an effector protein. So an effector protein is another protein that's going to be influenced or, or have an effect due to the due to this relay that's going on in here. And so that effector protein will then change its shape. So all of this binding and release causes shape changes. So we change the shape here and that could either cause an activation or inactivation of, uh, of this. In this case we activate it and now the effector protein serves as an enzyme. So what is that going to what, what is that going to do? So here in step four, uh, the activated effector enzyme now is going to catalyze a reaction that produces a secondary messenger in the cell. So here we have an inactive secondary messenger, and when the activated G protein binds to that effector, that causes uh, the effector to serve as an enzyme that now activates our secondary messenger. And that secondary messenger again might be something like cyclical AMP. Now the secondary messenger uh, is now activated and going to uh, activate other enzymes or even activate ion channels. In this case, the cyclical AMP will typically go and activate other enzymes that we uh, collectively call kinases. And kinases are enzymes in general that will transfer phosphates from ATP to another molecule. So they're involved in phosphorylation uh, overall. So uh, that's described here in step six. So these enzymes right here are those kinases doing that. So the kinase enzymes are going to activate other enzymes uh, by transferring phosphate groups into ATP. And so overall, this can cause uh, changes in the activity of the cell. Um, so it changes the metabolic uh, activities overall. So um, looking at uh, what we just covered here, which of the following is not a function of TAMs or um, cell adhesion molecules. Is it A, anchor the cell to other cells and the extracellular matrix? Is it B, SOS signals? Is it C, maintain the membrane potential? Or D, uh, mechanical sensors? And then what is the second messenger? Is it A, an intracellular chemical signal? B, a ligand? C, an extracellular chemical signal? Or D, a membrane receptor?